All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, where people can jump in and ask their questions around their website and web search. And we'll try to come up with an answer. Um, a bunch of stuff was already submitted on YouTube. But if any of you want to get started with their first question, you're welcome to jump on in. John, I have a couple of questions regarding internal linking. OK. Um, so uh, one would be whether, uh, uh, let's say you have an uh, architecture of categories that you use in your main navigation. Um, and it's one way on the desktop side. So for example, you might have some drop downs, some mega menus, things like that, that you can hover with your mouse. Uh, it, uh, the drop down shows, but you can also click on the link and go to that top category if you'd like. However, on the mobile, since you're kind of limited both in terms of space and functionality, uh, maybe that top category is still there with their HTML link. But when you uh, tap on it, it just lowers a drop down or something like that. Uh, so my question is if Google treats the fact that, well, there's a link there in the navigation, but when users tap on it, it doesn't actually go to that page. It just launches a drop down or something like that, even though there's an HTML link. So the behavior of the link is not actually acting like a link. It just shows you a drop down and things like that. Does Google treat those in any way differently? I, I guess it depends on how that that is modified on mobile. Because hmm. if, if we render that page, and essentially that HTML link is swapped out with a JavaScript event, and that HTML link is no longer there in the rendered page, then we, we might not see that internal link. But if so it's still there? If, if the HTML, if the link element is still there, if it's just something like a span on top of the, the link element, and that catches the click and does the JavaScript fanciness, that's, that's perfectly fine. OK, so there's no worry that, oh, there's not, it's not taken into account or or anything like that in terms of yeah. crawling. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, second question uh, is kind of related to how um, there's been this information that when Google sees multiple links going to the same page on a given page, um, uh, it only takes into account the anchor text for the first link that it sees on the page and kind of ignores the rest. I'm not sure if that's kind of exactly true, and whether, you know, uh, so for example, if you have a link in the menu, uh, but then you write an article about it, then you might reference the same page with a different anchor text. Does Google understand that and see, well, it's in the main content, so even if you have it in the menu, I'll take a look at that anchor text in the main content because it seems more important. Does that play any role? I, I don't think we have that defined like that behavior. So it can go either way. And it can be that we take kind of the multiple links that we find, and we combine the signals from that. So that's something where like, th that, that kind of misconception that if you have like multiple links to the same page on one page, then you need to make sure that the most keyboard rich anchor text is the first one on the page. That is not the sure. case. That's not okay. the case. So, uh, from, from that point of view, it's not that you need to artificially tweak the order of the links on the page, but it's also not the case that we we have kind of this one defined way that we always treat things uh, when we find multiple links on a page. Okay, I was ma mainly asking for like e-commerce website. They usually have a big menu with categories and things like that. Uh, they don't have a lot of space to use kind of very keyword rich anchors uh, in the menu. So they kind of you, you just have women or men or anything like that. But in the content, let's say you have a blog, and then that in those articles, you kind of reference those pages with uh, uh, more relevant anchor text. So I was wondering yeah. if, uh, if Google could t also take those uh, anchors into account. No. Yeah. From, from my point of view, we, we could take those into account. It's just not 
I clearly define that we will do exactly one to one. I, I think for the most part, with with normal websites, there's so many different links going to every page with internal linking that it's not not critical, like which anchor text you use from this one page to this one other page, because we have so much other information from the rest of the site. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, last one. Uh, so uh, certain, um, let's assume that certain pages are linked from multiple sections that are site-wide. Like you have one in the uh, main navigation, but you also have one in the footer, like let's say to the contact page or to the FAQ page or anything like that. Uh, and since page rank usually works by also counting, you know, it, the number of links on the page matter and the time uh, you mentioned uh, you link to a certain page also matter. Um, is that something like webmaster should take that into account? Like maybe don't have four links to the privacy policy page on every page on your site because that kind of takes away from the rest of the links you might have in your navigation, or is that too little of a factor to, to bother about? Yeah, I I don't think that would play a role. So I. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to see if I can play with something like that, maybe on our blog or something, where it's like we, we put like links to, I don't know, maybe a privacy policy 10 times instead of one time. But my, my feeling is that wouldn't change anything at all. I'm only asking since uh, certain tools like Screaming Frog, for example, they calculate the link score uh, in a very basic way, similar to how PageRank works. Yeah. So you might see like a link, uh, the FAQ page or the privacy policy page having a very, very high link score over some of the pages that you might want to be better internal linked. So yeah. I was just wondering if Google, if I know it's a very basic calculation that they do versus you know, what Google does, but I was just wondering if it's something that you could kind of try to tweak maybe here and there, or not really bother because Google kind of doesn't really care about that. Yeah, I, I think for the most part, it's it's wasted time to do that. Yeah. I, I think it's important that these tools show this kind of score internally, because sometimes you do kind of lose track of pages. And you think this one thing is really important, but actually, you only link to it once on your whole website. And then kind of getting that highlighted is, is really useful. Um, but for the most part, I, I wouldn't really worry about those details. Also, the, like the, the follow-up question from there is sometimes, like, should I no follow the links to my privacy policy page because I don't want it to rank? And we, we have a lot of practice with privacy policy pages and similar pages where we understand they're linked from everywhere within the website, but they're not the most important piece of content on the website. Yeah. So we kind of understand the these kind of relationships. But I, I think kind of having some kind of score, having a way to look at how a crawler would look at a website in a naive way, I, I think is really useful. So I I wouldn't discount those tools just because they don't map one to one to what Google does. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. I'm done. <laughs> sure. Cool. Anyone else before we get started? Uh, hi, John. I have one. OK. One of so, you. So, yeah. Yeah, that's me. So, I asked you the last uh, uh, Hangout question about that one of our websites kind of duplicating uh, home pages via the like, I mean, from one Japan, one from Brazil, but they're kind of folding together and Google thinks they are duplicate. So, just wanted to follow up that part. Like, I mean, is there something that I mean we can do from our end that can make it Google for quite you can say visible wise the other different pages or like you know, how we should go about that one. I I don't remember the the details there, but what was that something like you have the same English content on the page for Japan as well as on a page for another country? No, they are different. Both both pages are different content. Okay. Um I don't know. I, I probably need to take a look at the examples again. If, if right. you want to drop the links into the chat, I can pick that up afterwards. Sure. Thank you so much. I'll do that. Maybe add a comment as well, then I know exactly what, what to watch out for. All right. Cool. Thanks. And links in the chat don't pass any page rank. <laughs> All right. <laughs> OK. Someone else had another question as well. Hey, John. How are you? Hi. OK. I have two very, very small questions for you. 
uh, one is uh, regarding this search console insight that Google recently launched on Google Search Console. Uh, it seems that data that uh, Google shows is uh, based on Google Search Console plus Google Analytics. So just wanted to confirm if a website doesn't have Google Analytics account. So will you know that uh, insights will be, still be there or you need to have Google Analytics account for that? My understanding is you need to have it tied in with Google Analytics because the from so so I haven't been following all of the details with uh, Search Console Insights, but my understanding is that the idea is to kind of provide a, a mix of the data from Analytics and Search Console in a way that it's a little bit easier to understand for uh, people who who don't spend their whole life in Google Analytics or in Search Console. Uh, so that's something where it, we, we really kind of need to have both of those data sources so that we can show that kind of simplified data there. OK. Uh, the second question is uh, regarding nofollow. Uh, like it, it is believed that uh, Google doesn't pass page rank to a nofollow link. Uh, but recently, uh, like Google decided to crawl if the link is even tagged as nofollow. So if this Google decides to crawl that URL, will it pass page rank to that uh, URL after crawling? Or if Google decides, uh, thinks that this URL uh, is good enough to be crawled and indexed, but it, though we should pass the page rank or not? I, I don't think you can simplify it that much. Um, there, there are multiple aspects with regards to, to nofollow there. Uh, on the one hand, like, like you mentioned, we decided to start trying to treat it as a hint rather than a clear directive. And that can result in us following links that have a nofollow to discover new URLs. So especially if there's something that we haven't seen before and we see there's a nofollow link there, then we might go off and try to crawl that page. And if we think it's worthwhile, maybe we will index that page. Uh, so that's kind of the, the one aspect. But the aspect with regards to passing page rank and passing signals, that's something that's totally independent of that. That's something where we also need to take into account a lot more rather than just, is this a new page or not? So just because something got crawled that has a nofollow link doesn't mean that we're going to start passing all kinds of ranking signals to, to that page. It can, but it, it's not necessarily uh, required. John, to follow up on that, last I heard from Gary was that it's just currently a policy change around the nofollow, but nothing really has changed um, practically yet. Has that changed? <laughs> it's, it's possible. I, I don't know. Uh, Gary would, would be following up there more. But I mean, this is essentially the direction that, that we could be heading, where like, we, we have kind of those nofollow links, we could theoretically use those to pass signals. I, right. I believe we, we are using them for discovery already now. But I don't know. Gary would know more. All right. Thank you. Maybe I should drop him a tweet and find out. OK, let's jump into the questions. Um, we have the top question from Barry. Uh, can you comment more on the August 10th indexing system failure and maybe what happened this past Saturday. Uh, see your favorite SEO blog for more details. Um, how do you know what my favorite SEO blog is, Barry? That's it's like, are you reading my email? I have a little uh, malware installed in the computer. OK. OK. Well, if it's just that, bye. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any more information. Uh, so I. My, my feeling is with the August 10 issue, that's something where uh, it got resolved reasonably quickly. And uh, I, I don't know if the team would have more information to share on that publicly. And with regards to the one on the 15th, I, I don't know the details of what happened there. But that also seemed like something where even you kind of didn't really see what exactly was changing. Just like everyone was complaining, and then suddenly it was gone. Uh, so maybe that was just something really short. So I think technically it wasn't. It was only short because I didn't get back online until Saturday night. But I think it happened Saturday morning. Um, oh, okay. And then so I mean there were some screenshots from like Glenn Gabe and other people where it shows some pretty significant changes. 
Um, and then things went back sometime or I don't know, at night, at least Eastern time. Um, are you aware of anything that went wrong? Not like specifically tell me what went wrong, but did something go wrong? I, I don't know. It's like, there are lots it's of systems I don't know like Google. I comment or I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I really don't have any, <laughs> any additional information on that. So, okay. I mean, there, there are lots of systems at Google. And sometimes when, when something kind of quirky happens for a really short period of time, they just go off and fix it without letting everyone know. Um, I think the, the earlier issue seemed to have been a bigger one. And uh, that's, that's kind of also why it took a little bit longer to get everything redone. And uh, we ended up tweeting about it briefly. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, sometimes we don't have a lot of internal details to share. Um, OK, now a question about pagination, um, or five questions. Uh, what's the importance of pagination? Are there issues with pagination? What about infinite scroll? Should paginated pages be indexed? What is the best practice of pagination? Um, so. Lots of questions. Um, I don't know. Let me see if I can run through them, them briefly. So essentially, when we talk about pagination, we mean you have one thing that is really large, and it doesn't fit on one page. So you split it across multiple pages. And that could be maybe one long article where you say, well, it's worthwhile splitting this. Uh, it could be a list of individual products, maybe in a category. Uh, where you say, well, I have 5,000 products. I can't put them all on one page. I will put them on five pages or 1,000 pages or whatever. Um, so that's kind of where pagination comes in. And from our point of view, it's important that we can recognize this, this kind of pagination and essentially index those individual pages so that we can pick up all the content or all the links to individual items that you have on the paginated pages. Um, usually, with pagination, one of the questions that comes up is, well, this creates a lot of new URLs, because you have to go through all of these pages to get all of the content. And yes, it does generate a lot of URLs. And we have to index a lot of different pages. But if we want that content in our index, if we want to understand those uh, internal links uh, to your other pieces of content, we kind of have to do that. Uh, infinite scroll is a way of doing pagination without the user having to click next. Uh, the important part there is that you do infinite scroll in a way that makes that works for search uh, with regards to crawling and rendering in particular. And we have some guidelines on how to do that. Uh, so in particular, one recommendation is to have separate URLs for each page. Uh, so that you can still go to the individual pages, to have links to those individual pages. And for the user, if they scroll down to the bottom, then it's fine to load the next page kind of thing. Uh, should all paginated pages be indexed? Yes, kind of like, like I mentioned before. If there's something on there that you want to have known by Google, which could be a link to a different product, which could be a part of a longer piece of content, then it has to be indexed. And the best practices, I kind of like following up on, on the other steps there. We have to know about these paginated pages, so you have to link to them, usually with like a next and a previous link. And uh, with normal HTML links, we can pick that up fairly easily. You don't have to do anything uh, special for, for this kind of pagination. So just kind of link from one page to the next and link to, to the previous page as well. Then we can crawl through all of those paginated pages. Um, I kind of ran through this, and I know there's a lot more depending on what kind of setup you might have. Uh, so this is something where we will probably have a bit more information, in particular for e-commerce sites, uh, to make it a little bit easier to understand what exactly should be indexed with pagination. Uh, in general, we find that most sites implement pagination in a way that just works. So we've kind of stepped back from saying, like, we need to define exactly what people need to do for pagination. But rather, if you understand these pages need to be indexable, then you understand they need to be linked. You can test them with a local crawler. And uh, usually, that just works out. 
Um, Google is indexing pages with parameters. Uh, is this considered duplicate content? Should I use the URL parameter tool in Search Console to fix it as a best me method? Um, so in general, pages with parameters aren't necessarily bad. Uh, it's something where uh, in, in the past, maybe going back, I don't know, 15, 20 years, like really long time, search engines we're kind of reluctant to index URLs with question marks in them because it's easy to create a lot of URLs that way. Uh, but that has since changed, since a long time. And URLs with, with parameters in them are perfectly fine. Uh, sometimes they can lead to duplicate content. And in most cases, we figure that out ourselves. We recognize this URL with this parameter is the same content as the different URL with a different parameter. Uh, and uh, from our point of view, that, that essentially just works out. Uh, if, if you find that within your website you have a significant amount of duplicate content uh, and a significant amount of pages so that you can assume that crawling is really hard within your website. So say, for example, you have, I don't know, 100 million pages, and you recognize with the parameters that you're linking within your website you're creating 10 times as many URLs as you have pages, then those numbers are really, really big. And that's something where it definitely makes sense to go off into the parameter handling tool to resolve that, also to think about your internal navigation, where are these parameters being picked up on, and to, to improve that. Uh, so that's kind of. I, I guess the, the extreme situation. Most sites are somewhere in between. Some have just a few pages with parameters. And at that scale, I, I really wouldn't worry about those. Uh, any comments on Google blocking new publishers since December 2019? Um, so I saw a bunch of your tweets as well. Uh, I, I don't have any insight on that. I, it's definitely not the case that we're blocking any new websites from appearing in Search. Uh, there have been lots of new websites since then, and they, they do appear normally in Search. Uh, but it is something where you, you mentioned a bunch of examples where you thought things weren't working as well as they should, specifically for Google News. And I forwarded that out on to the Google News team to double check to see if there's anything that we could be doing better there. Uh, one of my websites. Uh, I yes. think that was related to like the News Publisher Center. Like if you submit it through there, it's not getting. I'm not even sure, but it sounds like it's something around the new Google News Publisher Center. Yeah, so I don't know if that provides more of something for you to look I, into. I don't know. I don't, I don't really have any insight into the news side. Uh, but uh, since crawling and indexing kind of is combined when it comes to news, if we can pick it up for search, then we should be able to pick it up for news as well. I, I think most sites don't do anything special to be picked up in news. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just, yeah. I don't know if there's anything specifically buggy with the news publisher center, like the Google search console for news publishers. I'm not sure. It's always yeah. possible that there's something buggy, but. It would surprise me if, if it were completely broken since December 2019. That seems like a pretty long time. I agree. Yes. Um, one of my websites got backlinks from a domain that embedded my Twitter page feed, and the backlinks are coming from that tweet link. I don't think embedded feed content links are followed by Googlebot. Please enlighten me. Um, I don't know how these tweets are embedded. But uh, in general, when we see things that are embedded with JavaScript or with an iframe on our website, it is possible for us to say that this part of the content could be seen as a part of that page. And it is possible that we, we will pick up links in tweets like that. Uh, that said, my understanding is that uh, Twitter pretty much uses nofollow links everywhere, so essentially, those would be no follow links uh, pointing to your website there, where for the most part, we wouldn't be passing any, any particular signals there. Uh, so from, from that point of view, I don't see anything particularly positive or negative with regards to SEO. Uh, if you get a link from one of your tweets that was embedded uh, on another person's website, I, usually it's a good sign that people like like the tweets that you're you're writing and maybe are okay with 
uh, the content that you're providing on your website, assuming they're writing about it in a positive way. Um, but uh, essentially, that's independent of any kind of SEO effect from those individual links. The thing to also keep in mind is that, in particular, in Search Console, the links that we show there are just all links or a sample of all of the links that we know uh, from the web for your website. So it's not that we would only be showing you links there that pass any signals or that have kind of any special weight. Uh, it's very possible to show things there that are maybe even disavowed, maybe that have a nofollow, uh, anything like that, too. Um, how does Google know about the category of a new URL being added later? So the URL wasn't mentioned in the sitemap. Um, I don't know how you mean the category of a new URL, but uh, assuming it's just generally how does Google know about this new URL that I added to my website and I didn't put it in my sitemap file, uh, we, we use lots of things to, to pick up new URLs, but we don't make them up. Uh, so Essentially, somewhere there must have been a link to this page within your website that could be within your own content, that could be within a sitemap file, within an RSS feed, uh, maybe someone else, maybe a, maybe a tweet, uh, anywhere, essentially. And uh, if we spot a URL and we think, oh, this might be something that's useful, we might go off and look at that page and see if we can index it. And if we can index it and we think it's something useful, then maybe we will index it. Uh, so that's essentially uh, the story of where, where the URLs come from. It's not that we have any kind of magic backdoor to your server and can look at what you're doing on your server or anything like that. We really kind of have to follow those links. And sometimes the, the links that we find are a bit surprising to people in that they don't realize that maybe a link is included in their RSS feed, even if they don't manually include it in a sitemap file. Uh, or maybe they don't realize that someone else has tweeted a link. Uh, or maybe you shared a link by email, and the email address you shared it to is actually a public mailing list. And suddenly, that link is in, in a public mailing list where we could also pick that up. Um, our website and our blog have an English and a Spanish version. In Search Console, we have a property for each language where we upload the sitemap separately. Uh, while the pages related to our service are translation, and therefore through hreflang we indicate it clearly, the English blog and the Spanish blog are not linked, as they have different contents. And we try to track traffic by offering different contents and different experience for each language. In the blogs, we implemented AMP versions for the articles. Uh, here are some questions. Uh, is it necessary to define the articles as canonical URL, since uh, I comment there the AMP version? Um, yes. So for connected AMP pages, I assume this is the case, that you have kind of one traditional page and the AMP page, and you link to them. Uh, with that kind of a setup, you need to use the rel canonical. That's kind of the definition of these pages. Even if you have standalone AMP pages where you just have AMP pages and no traditional content, you need to have a rel canonical on that page pointing to itself then. Uh, so that's independent of any translations, independent of any hreflang. Um, for the AMP setup, you need to have the, the rel canonical. Uh, is this configuration correct? Um, it's essentially fine to, to have it set up like that. Uh, so if you have some pages that are localized and you have the hreflang links between them and other pages that are just in different languages but not localized versions of each other, then you don't have the hreflang there. That's perfectly fine. hreflang is a per page annotation. You don't have to do it on all pages. You can do it just on the home page, do it just on an About Us page. Uh, you can pick and choose however you want. Um, we have some concern that URLs don't have an AMP page can't be fast enough. Uh, can this generate problems for the ranking of the blog articles? Um, so we, we do use speed as a ranking factor, but it's a fairly small factor. And you can make really fast pages that are not AMP. Uh, and you can also make slow pages that are using AMP. So just because one part 
of your site uses AMP and another part doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that the part without AMP is slower or in any way kind of uh, treated less favorably compared to the rest of your content. Uh, so I wouldn't primarily worry about this difference, AMP and not AMP, uh, but rather think about speed overall. And you can test speed on your side as well using the various speed testing tools that are out there. Uh, so instead of just kind of purely AMP or not AMP, I would look at the speed overall. Um, are the AMP versions used to measure and rate the URL speed performance of our articles? So in particular, with the new Core Web Vitals that, that is coming to, to search. We don't have a date for that yet, when that will be used as a ranking factor. We'll let you know at least six months ahead of time. But with that, we look at the page that users actually see. Uh, so if users see the AMP version of a page, and that's essentially the main version they see, maybe on mobile, then we will use that when it comes to our speed calculations. Uh, on the other hand, if people see kind of the traditional HTML version, they have to click a link to go to the AMP version or something crazy like that, uh, then we would use that page that we show the users, which in that case would be the traditional HTML version. Uh, we used to have pagination on our main blog, but we realized uh, that they were indexed in Search Console by mistake. Uh, the same pages with different URLs for pagination. We removed the pagination, and it looks like the issue is solved. Do we need to de-index those mistaken URLs? Um, so wow, more pagination questions. Uh, no, you generally don't need to do that. Usually, what happens when you have pagination activated like that on kind of a blog setup, then it's just like paginating through different previews of articles on your site. And it's just a parameter that's added to the page. And if you disable that, then essentially going to those URLs just shows the home page again. Uh, so if we recrawl and reprocess those URLs over time, we will see the home page, and everything will be fine. Uh, if, on the other hand, it results in those URLs returning 404, then we will recrawl and reprocess them and drop those URLs out of the index as well, uh, which is also fine. So either way, it's not that you necessarily need to do anything to remove those URLs from the index. Uh, can monetizing your website with an ad partner potentially hurt your rankings in Google? Uh, because after signing up with these partners, what I realize is they like to show more ads on your website. So I'm just worried if it will cause a drop in my ranking. Uh, well, I guess, in, in general, if you add monetization to your web pages, then that monetization has to be visible somehow, uh, which can result in ads being shown on your pages. So that's, on, on the one hand, kind of to be expected. Uh, on the other hand, with regards to Google rankings, we, we do have some things that we watch out for. Uh, so in particular, the above the fold content is something where we want to see some actual content, not just an ad. Uh, depending on the way that you have monetization set up, you might need to watch out for that. Uh, then there's a better ad standard, which is something that uh, particularly from Chrome they look at uh, for, for some pages where if they realize that, that a site is significantly not compliant with the better ad standard, then Chrome might decide not to show ads on that site at all. Uh, so that's something to look at. That's not necessarily related to SEO, but uh, it is kind of falls into the same category of, of types of issues. And uh, I, I think that's pretty much it. I, I think, in general, when, when it comes to monetization on your site, it's important that you do that in a way which is long-term sustainable so that you don't drive users away. Because if you drive users away from your website, then they're not going to be out there recommending your website to other people, which is something that indirectly we might pick up on in, in search with regards to kind of SEO things. Uh, so if you do decide to work with monetization on your website, which from our point of view is perfectly fine. It's like you have to pay for your website somehow. You have to pay for your time and your work somehow. Uh, so it's not that monetization is bad. But if you do decide to implement some kind of monetization, kind of make sure that it's implemented in a way that you can stand behind, where you can say, well, 
this is really the way I want my website to be presented in search, with the way I want my website to be presented to new users when they come and visit from the search results. Um, second question there, cross-posting my article uh, on another forum with a canonical URL, will that downgrade my ranking? My blog is all about programming, and I do like sharing my posts with a canonical URL on other developer forums. So is that going to hurt my ranking because the other forums are very authoritative and ranks very well on Google? Uh, so in general, what th there are, I think, two situations that can occur here. And it's something which our systems can't guarantee one outcome or the other. Uh, it's possible that we will index both of these pages individually. Uh, if we look at these pages overall and it looks to our systems like these are significantly different pages, then we may index them individually. And we may end up showing them in the search results separately, which could mean that the website that is syndicating your content is ranking above you. Uh, so that's something that theoretically can happen. The other alternative is that we recognize that these pages are significantly the same. And in that case, we will try to pick one canonical URL. And the rel canonical does help us to understand which of these pages you prefer to have being chosen as a canonical. And in that case, we will concentrate all of the signals on that one canonical URL. And we will use that one for indexing and ranking. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that the rel canonical is just one of the signals that we use for canonicalization. Uh, so there are also things like internal and external links, sitemap files, uh, kind of the, the hidden uh, links within a website, uh, all of those things which kind of play a role in determining which URL we should choose as a canonical URL. Uh, so it's not always guaranteed that we will pick your URL as a canonical. But those are kind of the two situations that can occur. And like I said, it's not guaranteed that it'll happen one way or the other. So if you do choose to syndicate your content like this, I think that's just something to kind of keep in mind in that it's possible that your information will be shared more broadly, and your information will be findable on other people's websites, and that maybe we will show the other website as the one in the search results ranking a little bit higher. Uh, so that's something where you kind of have to think about, um, is it important that my page is visible in search? And if that's the case, then maybe make sure that you're just publishing content on your website. Or is it important to you that my information is available in search? And in that case, maybe it's fine to publish it on multiple different websites. So those are kind of strategic decisions that, that you can make there. And I don't think there's one answer that works for all websites. Uh, if you have security reports in Google Search Console, after some submissions, Google will start to review them. After a couple of weeks, will this reflect other crawl bots like desktop, mobile, et cetera? Uh, so I'm not quite sure how, how you mean there. Uh, so it, it's really kind of hard to say. Usually, if there are security issues, for example, reported in Search Console, uh, that would mean for example, that maybe your website is hacked. Maybe there is malware that was found on some of your pages. Uh, maybe there was some phishing that someone hosted within your website. Then those issues wouldn't affect how we crawl the rest of your website. It can affect how we show it in search, in that if we understand your website is hacked, then maybe we need to be more careful with what we show your pages for. And so that's something that can play a role there. But I don't think it would affect how we would crawl your website overall. Uh, but regardless of any effect on crawling or indexing, uh, if, if your website does have security issues, I would recommend resolving those as quickly as possible and trying to figure out where they came from. Uh, so if your website got hacked, then don't just fix that hack, but rather think about like how were hackers able to actually get into my website and add that hack content? And what can I do to prevent that in the future? Uh, do backlinks from guest posts have any ranking value? Or are we wasting our time uh, for the sake of ranking and not for traffic? I don't know. It feels like this topic comes up every couple of weeks. Um, we've 
kind of had our stance on this since, since a number of years now. And essentially, the idea is if you're doing guest posts just for those links, then for the most part, I would assume that those links have no value at all. Uh, so that's essentially our, our stance there. And there, there are lots of kind of fine details there, uh, but we, we've talked about them so often. Uh, there's lots of information out there to kind of check into as well. Um, I work on a UGC website with more than 30 million pages of content. Main content of the pages does not change much, but the auxiliary content, like reviews and comments, are added frequently. Uh, we don't track where very well when each content is updated. Our sitemaps are updated daily with current value URLs, but setting uh, last mod for them as the current day. Uh, we also set priority and change frequency to static values. We suspect we're being limited by crawl budget. Can our sitemap structure negatively be affecting how Google is crawling our website? Website. Uh, so yeah, I, I think there are multiple things that come, come together here. Uh, in general, if you always have the same date in your sitemap file for all of your URLs, we're going to be ignoring that date. So if you're doing something like, like you mentioned here, uh, where you're taking 30 million pages and saying all of them change today, then we're probably going to be looking at your sitemap and saying, well, we're just going to look for new URLs within the sitemap file. We're not going to look at the date, because the date doesn't give us any more information. It's not that we can go off and recrawl your whole website every day. Uh, so that's kind of the, the main thing here. Uh, the priority and change frequency uh, settings are also settings that we generally ignore because we found that they don't provide a lot of extra information. Uh, if we have a date that we can use, then we don't need to know how frequently a page might be changing. Uh, with regards to kind of setting a date as a change date in a sitemap file, we recommend using the a date that is really significant for a change on your pages. So if, if things like just a number changes on your web page, that's not usually a sign that this page needs to be recrawled and re-indexed. Uh, but if something significant changes on your website on those pages, then that's something where I'd say it's worthwhile picking that up and using that as a new change date. So that's kind of. The, the recommendation with regards to change dates in, in general, the, the last modification. Uh, if you don't do that, if you have it set up like you have here, uh, we will ignore the last modification date, essentially. And we will just use the sitemap file to try to recognize new URLs on a, on a website. Um, but we don't kind of penalize a site for this kind of uh, sitemap file. It's not that we would crawl less frequently, or we would crawl worse if you have a bad sitemap file like this. Uh, we would just crawl naturally like we would any other website. And usually what that means is we will just like, go off and, and crawl pages on your website, uh, try to refresh them in cycles that we think kind of make sense. And uh, we will just use a sitemap file to recognize new, new things on your website. Uh, this doesn't affect crawl budget at all. So crawl budget is specifically more, more of a kind of foundational technical thing, uh, which is based, on the one hand, on the demand that we need, that we have on our side with regards to crawling and indexing, like how many pages do we think we need to recrawl from this website every day? That's kind of the one thing. Like We would like to do this much. And on the other hand, we kind of have the limits, which can be the limit that you set in the Search Console. Uh, it's also based on kind of the server capacity, um, how, how quickly do we think uh, your server can respond, um, how much, I don't know, how many requests can we send it every day, those kind of things. And those are all independent of the sitemap file. Uh, so just because just if you have a bad sitemap file doesn't necessarily mean we will crawl less frequently. We'll just crawl a little bit kind of more organically rather than uh, direct uh, based on your sitemap file. Uh, is canonicalization a best practice, or is not having duplicate content at all a best practice? Uh, I think a little bit of both. So not having duplicate content makes it easier for us to crawl and index 
kind of the, the primary content that you want on your site. But it's kind of impractical for all websites to not have any duplicate content at all. It's essentially normal part of the web. Uh, so because it's such a common thing on the web, using the rel canonical, using proper canonicalization just makes it a lot easier for us to focus on the good parts of your website. Uh, so reducing the duplicate content on your site is good. Using rel canonical is also good. Um, wow, lots of questions left. Let me just double check to see. There's one other crawl rate question. Can you suggest a, an optimal crawl limit for Googlebot? If I set a limit of 30 requests per second, is that enough? Um, that's totally up to you in your website. So we don't have any specific limits that we recommend. Usually, with regards to the Search Console setting, we suggest that you just leave it as let Google decide, uh, because the Search Console setting is more of an upper bound limit. It's not that you're saying Google will crawl this much, but it, it is that Google can crawl at most this much. Uh, so for most websites, you don't need to set an upper limit. We will figure that out ourselves. If you do notice that we're, we're killing your server and causing you a high bandwidth bill or something like that, then setting that upper limit is, is definitely a good idea. Um, wow, still a bunch of questions left, but time is running kind of low. Uh, maybe I'll switch to, to any questions from you all, if there's anything left from your side. Just wanted to quickly confirm that this person saying not a single website since December sixteenth and nineteenth, December twenty nineteen has been indexed or ranked that is new, like a new website. And I asked on Twitter, has any SEOs had any new websites indexed or ranked since December twenty nineteen? And I'm getting a bunch of yeses. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. I way. mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe it's not a general issue, but it's still worthwhile yeah. looking at these things. Yeah, sometimes they're weird quirks. John, can I ask another one on internal linking really quick? Okay. Uh, so, assuming, uh, let's say you've uh, changed something like the CMS of your website or something like that, and you have to use the three one redirects, and maybe because of some issues like with design or anything like that, you kind of have to link using those uh, 301 redirects. You cannot link to the final version. You, your navigation and most of your internal linking still goes to the old URL, which then 301 redirects the new one. For users, you kind of add that extra step of a 301 redirect. Uh, does that affect Google in any way? I know that Google kind of can pass over it and doesn't. So yeah, that's. I mean, it's, it's not great, but we, we work around that. So essentially what happens there is we try to understand what the canonical is. Um, so we'll follow that redirect, and usually we'll pick the destination of the redirect as the canonical URL. And then we will treat that link as being between the source page and the canonical destination. So just because there's a redirect in between doesn't mean that there's like any value loss. It's still linked between the source and the canonical destination. And just to be sure, uh, that 301 step, uh, that 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds that the user gets uh, in addition, uh, that, that's not happening on Google's side because you kind of pick the URL separately. You don't follow it like a user. Yeah, yeah. So the, the one exception, I, I think, is if you have more than five steps, five redirect right. steps in between, okay. then that's something where we'll have to recrawl that in the second round. Uh, but otherwise, we, we will follow those, those steps. We will index the destination page. Probably we'll pick the destination page as the canonical. And if we pick the destination page as the canonical, then users, when they come from search, they go directly to that canonical. They don't even follow those redirects. So even from a speed point of view, users would be going directly to, to that kind of canonical URL. And uh, from, from that point of view, it's more that you're adding a little bit inefficiency, and it's like you're keeping these things along, where if you crawl the website on your own, then suddenly you have all of this cruft that's kind of collected over the years. Uh, but it's not that it'll cause any any problems with regards to search. 
Okay, and one last thing is we have a, a weird case where uh, it's also related to pagination, uh, where the the link to the next page um, is one URL and it goes to the next page, but within a few seconds the link changes. I think it's using the uh, uh, history API, the push state or, or replace. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly which one it was. How does Google interpret that? Does Google see this URL change even though there's no refresh or of any kind uh, done? Or what exactly is happening on Google's side? Um, not 100% sure. <laughs> yeah, so we, we do watch out for this kind of uh, hit, hit when, when you use a history API to change the URL um, because we we do understand that some JavaScript-based site, you click on a link, and then it uses the history API to change the URL. And in that case, we should treat that as a link. And similarly, on some sites, you load one URL, and it uses the history API to change the URL. And that should be treated like a redirect. So that's something where we, we try to figure out like what it is that you're trying to do there assuming with that we can process the JavaScript that is done doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could be that we would treat that as a redirect to the URL that you're changing it to, um, which I don't know if, if that makes sense in, in your particular case, or if, if that simplifies the URL, or if that, yeah. yeah but so that's it removes some of the extra parameters that don't really are, there, are just for the CMS to understand. You, you want the next page, and it can remove those and only leave like page equals to something. Yeah. Probably you would see that if you use inspect URL, and you saw that we chose as a canonical the, the simpler URL. So right. that's something where you can check both of those URLs manually with inspect URL. If we've seen the simpler URL, um, Perhaps we have chosen that as a canonical for that kind of setup. If you check the more complicated URL and you see we picked the simpler one as a canonical, then it's definitely the case. Cool. Cool. Thanks. I'll try that. Cool. Hi, John, if I may. Sure. I don't know if you remember me. We spoke a couple of weeks ago. And um, I'm just really simple chasing up, really. Sorry to do this. Um, on the outbound link in, unnatural link in reconsideration saga, which we're going through. And um, I just wanted to see if you managed to take a look for us. Which site was that? Uh, oh, I think you posted it as well. The, the career site, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, I, I passed that on to the search spam folks, but I didn't hear anything back. So I don't know. Is, is it still like pending the reconsideration request? That was like yes. a long time ago, right? The reconsideration it request. Was initially from the 7th of May, the initial notification. So from the last status we received, which was the processed um, notification, it's been 14 weeks. I OK. Count. That's that seems yeah. too long. OK. Um, I'll, I'll ping them again to see if they can double check to see what, what is happening there. All right, brilliant. What's, what's your recommendation for how long we should wait anyway? Because it's been 14 weeks since we received the process notification, and we follow up um, a few times since. I think it's been around four weeks now since our last follow up, but we, we spoke about this on the last one, so I won't bring it up again. But uh, what's your recommendation for the wait period at the moment? I don't know. I don't know what uh, what the current queue there is. I, I mean, your site, I, I think it was in English, right? So it's not. Yes, yeah, in English. Yeah. Site, yeah. yeah. Some, sometimes it's a bit different across different languages, where someone from one of the local teams has to double check. Um, but it feels like, especially with English, we should be fairly up to date. I, I'm kind of. Curious to see if those kind of extra submissions that you did after the main one kind of block things on our side, but even that shouldn't be making it take that long. All right, thanks for that. No, it's just because sure. you said that you feared last time it could be stuck. This is why we're wondering still what to do. So yeah, if, yeah. You, if you could do something about it just to get us a response would be brilliant. All right, okay. WD40. <laughs> Cool. 
OK, we're kind of at time. Um, I, I'm sure there are more, still more questions, but feel free to maybe drop them into the, the next session on Friday. And uh, hopefully, I'll see you, some of you all there, or at least in the next uh, Tuesday one, depending on the time zone, whatever works better for you. All right. Thank you all for joining, and I uh, wish you all a great week in the meantime. Thanks, John. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.